Hej, jag heter Mega Hober. Jag arbetar som miljöstrateg i Järfälla kommun. Och vi är här tillsammans idag för att vi har räknat ut en koldioxidbudget i Järfälla kommun. Som första kommun i Sverige och kanske i världen så har vi räknat ut en koldioxidbudget. Och de som har gjort det åt Järfälla kommun är Kevin Andersson, Isak Stoddard och Jesse Schrage. Den har de gjort för att vi fick ett uppdrag i vår budget att utreda hur vi kunde arbeta med Parisavtalet och tvågradersmålet. För det här är hårdare kraven i Parisavtalet innebar att vi skulle eventuellt jobba med ett och ett halvt gradersmålet. Men vi har en miljöplan idag som handlar om tvågradersmålet och det är det som vi har pratat om tidigare sedan 1990 om att man ska minska koldioxidutvärmningen då med två grader. Så det är det som vi har förhållit oss till tidigare, men med Parisavtalet så kunde det alltså blivit hårdare. Eh, och vi har ju ratificerat det eh, Parisavtalet i Sverige och i EU. Och nu ville politikerna i Järfälla också kontrollera om vi kan jobba med det. Eh, den här rapporten visar att vi kommer inte att kunna göra det. Det är inte realistiskt att jobba med eh, två, eh, ett och ett halvt gradersmålet, utan det är två gradersmålet som är realistiskt. Och det innebär att vi måste minska våra koldioxidutsläpp med 10-15 procent per år från och med nu. Så det är eh, tillräckligt svårt. Och det kan jag skriva under att 10-15 procent per år från och med nu är ett jättetufft mål. Vi befinner oss i Järfälla gymnasiums aula. Och eh, vi gör det för att vi har fin besök idag. Vi har Kevin Andersson, Isak Stoddard och Jesse Schrage som har skrivit den här rapporten på besök och de kommer att hålla en föreläsning för oss. Så vi kallar den här delen av idag, som är den största delen av presentationen, Pathways to Fossil Free Futures in Järfälla kommun. Paris, Carbon Budgets and 2 Degrees Mitigation. Um, and we've prepared these slides um, and they're based on this report that Mega mentioned. And it's building very much on the, the research that Kevin uh, has brought to us here in Sweden from, from your home in, in Manchester in the UK. Um, and just to briefly say that we, we are based at a center for environment and development studies at Uppsala University and the Swedish Agricultural Science University. Um, and it's quite interesting because there's a lot of young people here today, which I think is great because these issues really concern your future uh, even more so than, than, than some of you who are, are a bit older. Um, and I think what's maybe interesting to know about CMS is that it's a student-initiated uh, and student-led uh, center in Uppsala. So it was really students who, who uh, in the early 90s, uh, came up with the idea to, to create this center. And we have about 600 students studying there every year. So I hope some of you might come to Uppsala uh, in the future and, and, uh, and study with us. So a brief outline on the presentation. Uh, I will just briefly cover um, follow up on what sort of the things that Mega was talking about and how we interpreted it in our, our assignment. Um, some very quick conclusions of our research and the main results. And then I will pass on to Kevin to speak about how to basically take the global issue of climate change and bring it down to a country like Sweden and using a method called carbon budgets to do so. And Then Jesse will jump in and talk about how we went from the Swedish context to think about well, what does this actually mean for a region or a place like Järfälla when we have to design policies and, and create politics that actually address climate change at the local level. And then I will sort of go into more depth of this and, and, and look a little bit more at Järfälla. We've done a little bit of investigation in terms of what, what's going on in Järfälla and, and, and also what sort of uh, pathways into the future Uh, we, could, we could see uh, if we are to hold to two degrees centigrade or the Paris, the commitments enshrined in the Paris Agreement. And after that we'll have discussion and questions. And what I missed there is of course the FICA and the Mingle and also that uh, uh, Mega, as Mega mentioned, she will mention a few things about what Jarfel is already doing now after that. Um, so very briefly, the context uh, in which um, we wrote this report is based very much on Uh, the temperature commitments enshrined in the Paris Agreement. And this was uh, an agreement that was signed two years ago by all the countries in the world. Kevin will say a little bit more about this before. Um, I hope everybody's heard of it. Has, how many people have heard of the Paris Agreement on climate change? 
Okay, so there's a few of you that haven't. So you'll learn more about it soon when, when Kevin speaks. There's also been a national process in connection to this uh, to determine what Sweden would have to do to address climate change. And this was the work of a group called the Environmental Goals Commission. Um, and we were also asked to relate our research to this, uh, to the results of, of this work. And it's now been, it's being proposed to be brought into law as the Swedish climate change law as of January 2018. And of course, like uh, Mega mentioned before, this uh, then has some consequences um, for, I mean, the results of our research have some consequences for how we see that Järfälla Kommun could uh, make their fair contribution to addressing climate change. And it should be said also that, as I've understood it, this is a, a document, the report that's been done is also a document that hopefully will inform the energy and climate plan, the climate plan which is a part of the larger environmental plan. Uh, so our, our work has been very much based on an analysis only of uh, energy and climate issues and not focus so much on the broader environmental issues or sustainability issues. So that's an important distinction to make. So that's, that's our contribution to this process and it has its limits. Um, and the outputs that we produced, as Mega mentioned briefly as well, is a carbon budget, which you'll learn more about soon, what it is, for Järfälla kommun. Uh, we have calculated how much emissions will have to decrease year by year from starting now, actually starting July 2017, in order to hold to uh, the, uh, the commitments of the Paris Agreement and, and keep our world under two degrees of warming. Um, and based on that, um, we have discussed and also presented our thoughts on potential pathways to a post-carbon, so that's a zero emission future, fossil free future in line with the climate commitments in the Paris Agreement. And the questions that we were asked to answer more specifically was in the, in the Paris Agreement there's, there's different goals in terms of how much the global temperature uh, can increase to, say, to stay within somewhat of a possibly safe uh, climate zone for, for, our, for the future. And uh, we were asked if Yarrafala Kommun can work with the 1.5 degree target, and if not, we were asked to explain why, which we hopefully, well, we've answered both those questions. Um, and then also, thirdly, we were asked to see if there are any examples of a municipality around the world or in Sweden uh, of how, or if there are examples of how a municipality like Yarrafala can work with the 2 degree target and make their fair contribution to delivering on the temperature commitments of the Paris Agreement. And we will, this is a bit of a spoiler in some ways. We will, we will tell you the results before we go into um, uh, telling you uh, how we got there. Um, and we will talk more about them later on as well and what that might entail in terms of how, how a municipality like Yarfala can react to this, but also, I mean, other, other entities like a school like, like Järfälla Gymnasium could respond to, um, to this challenge as well. Um, so our analysis says that current global carbon emissions, which is not all greenhouse gas emissions, carbon is, but it's the most important one when it comes to uh, delivering on the more long-term um, um, uh, climate uh, commitments, if we continue on the, the trajectory that we're on now with current emission levels, we will have no more emissions, so no more emissions that we can let out in 18 years. So that's not much time. Um, and in order for Sweden and Järfälla to uh, make their fair contribution, they need to aim for 15% carbon reductions, carbon em emission reductions per year for a likely chance of staying within 2 degrees Celsius. And that's not only enough, uh, we also have to realize that we have a historical responsibility and we have, we have as, as people living in Sweden, or at least I speak for myself and uh, uh, many living in Sweden, uh, have had too much of the pie uh, historically. So we also have to support poor countries in developing uh, zero carbon societies and to sort of leapfrog, uh, uh, so skip the sort of the, the type of industrial development that we've seen in Sweden. Otherwise we have no chance of staying under two degrees. Um, and yet, in front of municipality, it's just sort of, and uh, one of the last things we conclude and, and that we'll discuss in more detail is that Yarfala municipality can lead the transition to fossil free society. We've seen some really, you know, um, some, some big challenges, and, but also some opportunities in our analysis. So um, this is something we'll, we'll dive into uh, later on. 
So with that, I think I'll pass over to Kevin, and he'll get to say a few things, and then uh, Jesse, and then I'll be back in a minute. And I want to go through, building on what uh, Isaac has spoken about, say a little bit about um, the challenge that we face and how it is we've gone from the commitments that we've all signed up to through our government, through a democracy, in Paris, um, how, that, how that will play out for us here in Sweden and indeed also for the UK or the US or the rest of, the, the rest of Europe. And, and the, for those that weren't aware, the Paris Agreement was a major set of negotiations between pretty much every single world leader. Um, obviously Donald Trump wasn't in power at the time, so it was, it was Obama that was there. But all the world leaders came together in Paris in December in 2015 and they all agreed to do something very significant on climate change. So this was a major set of negotiations. And these negotiations occur every single year. That was the big set in 2015. So there's, there's another set of negotiations this year in Bonn, in, in Germany, in uh, November, which we're going to as well. So um, what I'm going to try and do is just take you through from our Paris commitments, explain this, this concept of carbon budgets, which have a whole sort of scientific basis to it. And the science is really important to think about these issues. Relate that to our carbon budgets um, for 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade, and I'll explain a bit about those in a minute, because they're, they're a bit meaningless, really, for most people. And then say, what would Sweden have to do to make its fair contribution to holding uh, the temperature rise that we're seeing from burning fossil fuels to no more than 2 degrees centigrade? And then look at that in relation to the Swedish climate change law. So I want to pull all that together in the next sort of 20 minutes or so. Now, this is the Paris Agreement, and like all international agreements, they're not, they're not the most exciting read. There are about 32 pages that look something like that. So, um, I mean, they're worth reading, they're very important, but they're not, they're not written to be exciting. Um, and I'm going to focus on that particular paragraph there. That's the, the bit that, that, that underpins a lot of the work that we do with Isaac, with Jesse, and with other colleagues at Seamless in Uppsala. And so you can read that a bit more clearly. This is that paragraph that we have, as an international community, and that includes all of us, remember, we've signed up to take, take action to hold the global average temperature rise to well below two degrees C of warming above the pre-industrial levels. That means before we started burning fossil fuels in about 1850-ish. Um, and also to pursue efforts to hold the temperature to only one and a half degrees C of warming. Now to most of you that probably means nothing really. You know, two degrees C of warming, two degrees centigrade on a cold day in Yafala or in Uppsala or in Manchester. I mean two degrees C doesn't mean too much to us. But two degrees C change in the global average temperature is a huge shift. During all of the time of humans on the planet, which is about 300,000 years, we've only seen variations of about one degree at the most. And we are now seeing another degree on top of that already. And we are, we are locking ourselves at the moment into probably three or four degrees if we carry on. So no time during human civilization going right back, way before the Egyptians, right the way back 300,000 years, have we seen anything like what we're now starting to see? So two degrees C is a huge change, but also it doesn't happen average, in an average way around the planet. We don't live in the climate, we live in the weather, and it will have huge impacts on extreme weather conditions. So some parts of the world will see lots more droughts, other parts will see more floods, uh, the changes in, in rainfall, which will affect agriculture. So two degrees centigrade is a very big shift. In the poles, in the Arctic, for instance, it's about six degrees C of warming, the equivalent. And that means you'll melt most of the Arctic ice during the summer. So it's a very large um, temperature increase. And the one and a half degrees C was pushed really hard by um, Bangladesh particularly, but also by the association of small island states, which are, there are islands in the Pacific that are only just above sea level anyway. And those countries said that we need to have one and a half degrees C of warming, because at two degrees C of warming, those countries will not be um, viable anymore, particularly the small island states. But we also promised to do this in accordance with the best science. Notice that, the best science, not the best politics, but the best science. And um, also on the basis of equity. In other words, rich parts of the world, like the UK, the EU, Sweden, the US, should do a lot more earlier than the poorer parts of the world. And I don't really think that two degrees C, one and a half degrees C, the best science or equity are things that really anyone would argue about. Well, you know, these are things that certainly in, the, in Europe, and even in America, a lot of the people in America would say, this is, this is fair, this is what we, we're supposed to do. So we have all signed up to this. This is a commitment we have made. And when you, we've made it, 
We've made it really you know, to future generations, and by that I mean, I, mean, I hope to be here for a long time still, but you know, I'm probably not going to live as long as most of you will be. So we've signed up for this, for your futures, so when you get to be 20, 30, 40, 50, that you will be living in the climate change that we are, that we are putting into the environment today. So we're signing up for your futures, and we're also signing up particularly for poorer people elsewhere who are already suffering the implications of climate change that we've put, put, um, imposed upon them. So um, the, the backdrop to, to, to the Paris negotiations in 2015, I think this is worth bearing in mind, is that the, there's a big United Nations group um, that comes together every few years, and it assesses all of the science that's been published and work that's been done in the previous seven years. And these, these, this group of um, scientists then publish a set of reports every five to seven years. And it's called the IPCC. Climate change is full of these acronyms. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is, the, this is really the best sort of science that is out there. And the first report on climate change came from them in um, 1990. Before most, well before most of you were born. Or probably quite a few of you were, were born in, in, um, you know, since 2000. So we're talking about right back in 1990, a quarter of a century ago, over a quarter of a century ago. And we have known what to do about climate change, and we've known it's a big, been a big concern ever since then. And yet, when, you know, what have we done? Almost nothing. And what's, what's quite disturbing is that in that quarter of a century, when you've been living your lives, the emissions of carbon dioxide, of the main greenhouse gas, have gone up in the atmosphere by 60%. So we'll be 60% higher emissions this year than in 1990. So when we, even though we've known about all of this, we've done nothing about it. Um, and even when you look at people living in Sweden, and Sweden is one of the more progressive countries in the, in the world. If you come from the UK, you definitely see that. It's a much more progressive country than the UK, for instance. But even in Sweden, the lifestyles of the average Swede have not been lower carbon since 1990. When you factor in aviation and shipping, and, and the imports and exports that go on in Sweden. Swedish people still today live just as high carbon lives as they did in 1990, so no reduction. So we've not really started well on this for a quarter of a century. The other thing that is really important, that, that is now embedded in the latest set of reports from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is that in terms of these temperature rises, what really matters is not what we do in 2030 or 2050 out in the future, but actually something called carbon budgets. This is what the science tells us very clearly. Um, so it's the carbon budgets that matter, and I'm going to sort of outline what they actually are when we think about them, because they're not an immediately obvious way of thinking about these issues. So if we think about this um, graphically, here we have carbon dioxide emissions going up on the left and the years out along the bottom, and this is just a sort of stylized account of our emissions so far since 1990. And what happens in 2045, which is when the, um, the Swedish government have said we were going to get towards zero emissions in Sweden, isn't really that important. What really matters is the area under the curve. So if anyone drove to, to, to school today, or even if they came by, um, you know, by a tram, and if that tram was powered by electricity, and that electricity was generated using some gas or some coal, that carbon dioxide will be in, in the atmosphere now changing the climate for the next hundred to several hundred years. So it's, the, so it's the emissions we put out every single day, as we go up here, that matter. They build up. The emissions tomorrow will add to today, and the emissions after that will add to the following day. So you get that ongoing build-up, so it's the carbon budget that matters. And that means if we, if we choose not to do something in the near term, we don't make reductions. So in Sweden, for example, you're looking to expand your um, airport near here, and you're looking to build another airport up north so Swedish people and others can go skiing in the north of Sweden. Now, if you build those airports, then you're, that means your emissions will go up. And if your emissions go up, that means at some point in the future, emissions have to come down even faster to stay in that carbon budget. And when we think about that, that means you will have to bring the emissions down faster. Because you're the ones that are going to have to deal with this. You know, you'll be leaving school and it's your problem. People of my generation will be handing the problem on to you. So you're going to have to look after this. So you should be holding people like me to account now. Now this will be very difficult. I would argue it's probably going to be impossible to make the bigger changes necessary in the future. And if we don't make those changes, then you will suffer the impacts of climate change. And they will be very significant. Even in Sweden, we'll see much more um, movement of people around the world, much more migration. We'll see the changes in food patterns. We'll see the price of food going up. We'll see increases in sea level rise. There's a whole suite of things that are going to happen that are not desirable at all. So let's quantify this in a bit more detail, as scientists always like to do, they always like their numbers. Um, so 
These are gains, it's a bit like I showed you before. This is our carbon dioxide emissions on the, um, on the left, on the axis going up, and then the years on the bottom. And these are our carbon dioxide emissions so far. And you can see, you can see the history, of our recent history here. These are big, big fires that occurred in Indonesia in 1990, and they put a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just after that, you can see that it will dip there. That was September the 11th. After September the 11th, um, in the US, there was about six months of um, less economic activity around the globe. People used less fossil fuels, so there's less carbon dioxide. So you can see our history in our, in our um, a fingerprint, if you like, in our um, carbon emissions. And before Paris, the way we were using fossil fuels, even though we knew all about this, and we pretended to care about your futures, we were heading towards four to six degrees C of warming. Now, just to give you some sort of idea what that's like, the difference between now and an ice age is about five degrees centigrade, and that normally takes um, you know, millions of years, certainly so tens and thousands of years at least, to get those ice ages. And yet, within about 100 years of burning fossil fuels, we're having the same sort of size change to the climate that we're bringing about knowingly in just about 100 years. So that is very fast indeed. In fact, most of that change will probably occur over about 50 to 70 years, 50 to 70 years that you'll be living. But with Paris, every country in the world promised to do something very significant, including Sweden and the EU. And actually, when you add up all the promises that every country said, every country said, we will reduce our emissions, we will try and do something. But actually, it didn't, aim up, aim, uh, didn't add up to 2 degrees centigrade. They still add up to 3 to 4 degrees C of warming. I'm not going to go into the details for that, but 3 to 4 degrees C of warming means that we will be heading towards 1, 1, 1.5 metres of warming by the end of the year. A lot more heat waves, maybe 6 to 12 degrees C warmer during heat waves which I know is quite hard to imagine in Sweden or the UK, but I mean, they, they happen in Europe, the big heat wave in 2003 where 20 to 30,000 people died. Now that heat wave would have been 6 to 12 degrees C warmer and a lot longer. Many, many more people will die in those heat waves. And they're of course already been affected elsewhere in the world. So 3 to 4 degrees C is a very dangerous temperature increase. But that's all that, that's all that, um, the, 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 the world has come together, all the countries have said they're going to achieve so far. And yet, within Paris, what we've also said is that we will hold to two degrees centigrade of warming. Indeed, we said we'd hold for one, try and hold for one and a half. And if you play that out now, it comes up, there you go. That, this here is what we would have to do in terms of our emissions. So this is where we are today. We have to bring our emissions down, carbon dioxide emissions. Remember, when we talk about carbon dioxide emissions, we're principally talking about fossil fuels. Petrol, diesel, you know, when we fly somewhere, when we burn coal in a, in a power station, when we burn gas in a power station. So it's basically the fossil fuels. So that is saying we have to remove all the fossil fuels sometime around, by around about 2050 at a global level. At a global level. So that's a huge, I mean, that's not just our electricity, that's our planes, our ships, our industry, our cars, everything. But that's globally. And again, Sweden, as a progressive country, along with the UK, as a slightly less progressive country, we all signed up to say we would do this on the basis of equity. In other words, we would think about the poorer people in the world, that's most of the people in the world, as well, and that they would have longer to make this transition away from fossil fuels. So we would lead the way in the wealthy parts of the world. So what are Sweden's commitments under the Paris Agreement? Well, I'm just going to apply just a bit of, sort of, it's a bit boring this, but it's sort of what I call a logic here. How do we go from Paris to what that means for Sweden? Now, Sweden is committed, along with other parts of the world, to make its fair contribution, and the word fair is really important there, make its fair contribution to reduce its emissions, in other words, use less fossil fuels, in line with 2 degrees C and 1.5. Now, we know what they mean in terms of carbon budgets. We have that from the science about how much carbon dioxide we can put in the atmosphere over the next, say, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We know what that is. We can then make some assumptions about what would the poor countries, the poorer countries of the world, and the, what we're often referred to as the non-OECD, and we're trying to remember what this means again now, the Organization of Economically Cooperating, co co for co the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, and that is generally the wealthy parts of the world, so the non-OECD are generally the poorer parts of the world, and it does also include China. So imagine that they really did try to do a lot in those countries, then what you could do is you could subtract their emissions from the global carbon budget, and that would tell you what the budget is left for the rich parts of the world, the OECD countries, Sweden, the US, Japan, Australia, the EU. And then from there you could say, well, actually, but what, por what part of that pie of, of emissions is, proper, is, is appropriate for Sweden, or for the UK, or for anywhere else? And this is some work we've done here um, 
you know, thanks to Jaffa for having the insights to think about these issues. So what would this mean for Sweden? So if we play this all through, the first thing I'm going to say is that what we've assumed in our work is that poor parts of the world will make very significant changes very quickly. So we're not, we're not saying to them, you, can't do you don't have to do anything about this. They're going to have to really make a lot of effort. And this curve won't mean very much to most of you. But it just, if you just look at the shape of it, again, this is their fossil fuel use, and they're going to have to bring it down very rapidly. And if you look at the dates at the bottom, it's a bit later than we will have to do. You'll see that in a minute. They need to be sort of heading towards, towards zero emissions by about 2050, 2060, that sort of time frame. So that's still very rapid for the poorer parts of the world. So you then have the, once we know that, we know what those emissions are, we can work out from that what the emissions are for the wealthy parts of the world, and I've removed all that maths from this and just said, well, okay, how, how does that look for Sweden, if we played that out for Sweden? Well, the first thing that's a concern is that even if the wealthy, even if the poorer countries do everything we think is possible, which is hugely challenging, then that will exceed the budget for one and a half degrees C of warming. In other words, in any realistic sense, it's now too late. We have locked that climate change into the system and into our existing infrastructure. So we are already going to exceed one and a half degrees centigrade. We're very, very likely to, very soon as well. So let's look at the remaining two degrees C of warming, which is still really important if we can try and stay below this. Then for Sweden, again, these numbers won't mean a lot to you, but Sweden has about 300 to 600 million tonnes of carbon dioxide it can put in the atmosphere. Now that sounds like, well, it sounds like nothing or it sounds like a lot. It probably doesn't mean too much to you. But just to give some sort of feel for it, in 2014 and 15, um, Sweden put out about 44 million tonnes. So that just gives you some idea quite quickly. You think, well, you've got, this is, remember, this is your total carbon budget for Sweden forever. And you put out 44 million tonnes in one year. So a bit of maths will tell you that's probably about eight years and that's probably about 15 years. So in between 8 and 15 years of current emissions, there'll be no emissions left for Sweden for its, for its fair contribution to 2 degrees centigrade of warming. And we have to bear in mind that 2 degrees C is not a safe threshold for poor people living elsewhere. Many people will die, and they'll, they will die even below 2 degrees centigrade. Um, but that's probably the best that we can do now. So we still need to aim for it as much as we can. And actually, if you take account of your whole lifestyle, because when we normally think about emissions, we just think about our local power station or where we drive somewhere. So we think about emissions in our boundaries. But actually, when we look at it, this laptop here was made in China. So the emissions for this laptop, are they the Chinese emissions responsibility or my emissions, Sweden's emissions? So some of this should certainly be the responsibility of, of us. So places in the world like China and other parts of Asia, they make a lot of the things that we now use. And if you take that into account as well, the average Swedish lifestyle, then you're talking about 74 million tonnes, almost twice as much as our use of energy in our, own, in our own boundaries. So we have to think about that as well. So the headline message for Sweden is that if Sweden is to meet its Paris commitments, and I'm, I'm taking Sweden at its word, I'm assuming it was not lying when it went to Paris and said we will, we will meet these commitments. So I, I'm, I think the politicians in Sweden need to be held to account. That's what they signed up to. That's what we have signed up to. And if it's going to be based on science, the best science that we have, which of course seems sensible, and again, that is what we signed up to in Paris, then we have to start reducing our emissions in Sweden at between 10 and 15% every single year starting now. Now, there's always a bit of uncertainty in climate change. Like all science, there's never, there's never exact numbers or perfect facts. There's always a bit of uncertainty. And climate science is just the same. But somewhere between 10 to 15% every single year in emissions is what we have to come down every year, not just one year. And if you think about that over just the next few years, by 2025, which is just, what, eight years from now, we're talking about something like three quarters of your emissions, our emissions in Sweden, will have to be removed from the system. Three quarters. Just think of your own life. Could you reduce your emissions? That means your use of energy by three quarters. Your house is colder, you don't drive as far, you hardly ever fly somewhere. You know, it starts to have a big impact. And by 2035, you know, very little time really from now, um, you know, you'll, be, you'll just be sort of setting up, setting out, doing reasonably well in your careers by then. By that time, we'll have had to use up, we'll have used up all of our carbon budget, or approximately. So you'll have to be living in a world in Sweden, and I will be as well, hopefully still, alive in 2035, um, that will be no carbon in your planes, no carbon in your ships, no carbon in your cars and your power stations. So you know, a carbon-free world. Now that is a massive challenge. And if you put that on a graph, if you like graphs, 
You can see the shape of the curves here. So we are talking really about Sweden aiming to be pretty much zero carbon by 2035. Now how does this play out against the climate change law that Sweden has very successfully passed, or at least it will be passing and put coming into force in, in January. So these are the emissions so far from Sweden, and the projections are, government projections effectively are, it's going to carry on like this, and if it just carried on after that, it would just go on something like this. Remember, but that important part there is that it excludes aviation and shipping. So aviation and shipping emissions are exempt at the moment from, um, from, from Sweden thinking about its emissions. It, it should be including them, but it doesn't. But no other country does as well, it's not just Sweden. Now, the, the Swedish government under the climate law is going to bring its emissions down to zero by about 2045, or maybe between 85 to percent and zero um, by 20, 2045. But actually, when we look at what needs to be done to meet the Paris commitments, if it wants to make a fair contribution, it needs to be doing this. Look at the difference between those two. They're huge. So whilst our work says you need to be zero emissions by about 2035, Sweden says it's going to be nearer 2045. The difference in carbon budgets is very large, and that means a, not a fair contribution, an unfair contribution to two degrees centigrade. Expect other countries to do more, or Sweden is saying to poorer parts of the world, you will have to live with a lot higher temperature increase, and of course to you in the future as well. Now it's not just Sweden doing this. Sweden is already well ahead of many parts of the world thinking about climate change. The UK is just the same. So this is, this is taken from a UK government document, and um, this is our emissions in the UK, and this is where we expect to go, according to the government. Now take away all the noise from that, and that's the shape of it. But if the UK was to make its fair contribution to two degrees centigrade, it would need to look like this. So what you see are huge differences in the UK or in Sweden. The two countries that are really demonstrating, in terms of policy, some real leadership, and yet the leadership is nowhere near what is necessary for Paris. So why is it so different? Why is the politics of climate change so different from what the science is saying? And the first thing is that the Swedish government has not based its policies on carbon budgets. And actually, if it wants to um, you know, have a sort of science frame to it, it needs to do that. So at the moment, the Swedish climate change law is based more on politics than it is on science. And it needs to, the science part needs to be strengthened significantly. The second part is that Sweden has taken a too large piece of the cake of the, of the carbon budget for itself. And that's not fair. As a progressive country, it should have taken a smaller slice. Again, the UK is the same. It's taken too big a slice. So it's not equitable. So we've not really thought about the poorer parts of the world in this. And we need to think about them much harder than we've thought so far and reduce our part of the, of the carbon budget cake, if you like, that we have. And the other thing, which I'm not going to go into any detail, but it's really very important, is that there's a reliance, it looks like, from what we can tell, there's a reliance in Sweden, certainly in the UK, and in most countries in the world, the wealthy countries, the high emitting countries of carbon dioxide, um, that we're going to be relying on something called negative emission technologies, which sounds like something you can go and buy. These things don't exist. These are technologies that at the moment are in people's imaginations. And these are hoped in the future, and remember that these are people who, people like me have them in my imagination, and I'm hoping that you will make them real in the future, your generation. And that you will be able to suck the carbon dioxide, remove the carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. So rather than, you know, that means that we can carry on today burning carbon dioxide, people like me can carry on flying to academic conferences and going on holiday, and then you will have to solve the problem in the future by removing the carbon dioxide that my flight has put into the atmosphere. These things don't exist. These are imaginary, and yet Swedish government policy is based on these, and so is the UK policy. So um, that's sort of trying to lay out how we go from Paris to what the challenge is for Sweden. Now my colleague Jesse is going to go through and explain how you go from what's happening in Sweden to what you need to be doing in Jarfala and you know, think about your own school and institutions. So my assignment in this report um, was to start looking at, as Kevin mentioned, how can we actually share that piece of the cake that we have in Sweden. Now there's many municipalities in Sweden, many regions and so on. Uh, and I had to look at how we can actually share it in a really fair and equal way um, for all of us to actually have a fair share. So what did we look at? Um, we took Sweden and we, as, as Kevin mentioned, we came up with a budget which included a lot of things in there. We had all of the aviation and the shipping. We also had um, all of the industry. 
So the electricity that is used today uh, is counted in uh, how you came here, if it's by um, a carbon fueled transportation, that was also included. Um, whether it is your industrial needs or the meat that you bought and so on. So this is all factored in. This is what we kind of try to gather, the amount of carbon. What is not included though, and I, and I think that's really important for you to, to realize, is, is all the goods and services that you buy from abroad. So for example, the Chinese laptop, for example this one, this one was not factored in. Why? Because then it becomes a lot more complicated to kind of allocate um, accurate budgets or accurate emissions. Um, so once we have this budget, and for Sweden it was between 300 and 600 megatons of CO2, um, we had to think about some principles. So now that's when you get a bit of into ethics or philosophy, because here we need to find a way of sharing the piece of the cake equally. So I, I want you to think about it uh, maybe more abstractly. So all of you know, uh, maybe carbon budgets can be a bit metaphorical or a bit like too, too far removed. I want you to think about it as a big cake that we all have to share, or big canel bulle, which is one of my favorite things uh, in Sweden. Um, so how can we share it equally? How can we all make sure that we have a fair share of it? Or we can say, let's just share it based on the amount of people in this room. If we have this cake, every person gets the same share of the cake. That sounds fairly fair, right? Um, so that's called the um, egalitarian uh, principle. So we look at population and we just divide the cake. A second one is to look at your historical emissions or grandfathering. Now, going back to the cake, imagine that here, um, you would say, well, I, Jesse, I love, I love cake, I, I love kind of bullet, and I eat at least two a day. So out of that whole bullet that we have, I want like twice as many shares as most of you there. All right? And that's because of maybe my needs and so on. A second one, um, a third one, sorry, is your ability to pay. So imagine I paid for it. Then I can say, well, I want to have a bigger share because I put most of the money in there. That's also one of the principles that we can look at. Um, and the last one is that um, is, is something fairly famous. It's called the polluter pays principle, where uh, we look at the emissions at one specific time and we say, and we can divide uh, in function of that. So imagine I say I'm really hungry. This is I really have a need of can and bullet, and therefore I should have a bigger piece. Now all of those have uh, have their pros and cons, and we can kind of debate about them. Um, but they have to be put into context. They have to be in relation to what Yalfela is doing, in relation to what your specific emissions are. And I think that's really important to think about. Um, when we look at a region, it becomes a bit more difficult because the scale is really small. So there's like a lot of overlap between Yalfela municipality and Solentuna or Solna or Stockholm and so on. So there's a lot of emissions going across the boundary here, which are difficult to take into account. Um, oops. So the second point there is that your, your quality of life as citizens of Uppsala is actually maintained from emissions that are created in other parts of Sweden, that are created maybe in the south, depending on uh, your food preferences, that are created in Solentuna, depending on uh, if you take the bus, or the subway, or the train, and so on. So you have to be aware that there are a lot of, like, looking into it at such a small case, uh, scale has a lot of overlaps. Um, and so a lot of the principles don't really work anymore. Population doesn't work anymore. We had to start looking at grandfathering principle, which assumed that, let's say, the share that Yalfela had, historically, would be the same for later, for the future. So your proportion of the national share should, be, should remain the same across. Uh, what does that mean in terms of number? Um, we calculated that for Yalfela, the budget range would be between 423 and 900 kilotons of CO2. Um, and I want to use like a, a comparison that uh, Kevin also kind of showed earlier. In 2016, this municipality emitted 73 kilotons of CO2. Um, that's, that's also not giving us much time if we only look at Yalfela's budget, Yalfela's municipality budget. So what is meant in here? What do we mean by this? So what does it mean to have those, uh, that budget range for all of you? 
That means that we're going to be, that this means that your heating is included, whether it is in this gymnasium here or at your house, at your apartment. It's the electricity produced to, uh, to light these rooms and so on, or the projector or the computer. Um, the transport needed for you to come here, whether they are public or private, and whether it's petrol fuel, diesel fuel, the gas and so on. Um, but it's also all of the goods that you have consumed today. So imagine there's a bakery here and you bought some bread today. That energy is also put into the calculation. But what is also important is that we also looked at the emissions in other municipalities. And that is because when you look at the carbon budget, this framework we've used, uh, it makes the municipality responsible for the emissions of its citizens. So it's not only uh, what the municipality is doing, it's also what you individually are doing and how you are living. Um, so then it becomes a bit, uh, a bit tricky to think about it. An example, uh, you have fellow commune, and so we have included, as mentioned, the flights, and if, uh, if let's say, someone goes um, and uses petrol in the commune, uh, your industry, your manufacturing, and so on, uh, and the carbon budget takes those into account. But if as a, municipal, uh, as a municipality you do not want to work with them, or if those become problematic, then um, you as an as, as a, as a individual, but also as municipalities, will receive a smaller budget. That means that the mitigation rate, so your reduction, will be a lot more harsher, will be a lot more smaller. So, what does this mean um, for, for your fella? if we look at uh, using this framework of carbon budgets? Well, if we assume that your fella, as the Swedish government, is to contribute to the temperature targets, if it says, okay, we actually want to work with a two degree target for the future, um, and if it wants to work um, with scientific basis for its policies, so that means quantifying it, which we have done in this report. Then this means that for Yatala municipality, the mitigation rate has to be between 10 and 15 percent per annum. Now, we have this range here because the 10 percent uh, is assuming starting now. Um, and as, as Isaac mentioned, actually, it's supposed to be in July uh, this year. So only three months ago, you should have been reducing your emission by 10%. Um, and so 10% doesn't really become an achievable uh, target if we actually we do want to live in a two degree world. So 15% is actually the uh, decrease in emission rate that you want to have as a municipality. Um, and so this kind of is a bit of a parallel with the national Swedish government where we look at a 75% reduction by 2025 and almost a full decarbonization by 2035. Um, and, and as, as uh, Kevin mentioned, those, those targets are extremely uh, brutal. Like the, the logic behind it is, is extremely brutal because it's asking direct action, whether it is you as an individual, but also the school, for example, or the municipality as a whole. Um, and that was my part. Um, the next part with Isaac, we'll be looking more specifically at what does it mean for your fella to actually decrease those things, what kind of solutions or what kind of paths can we actually go forward with it. So, thank you. So, I'm, trying, I'm going to try to go into a little bit more uh, specifics here in terms of Yarfella and when we, when we looked at Yarfella and this is sort of just playing out these emissions reductions or the decrease uh, of uh, carbon emissions per year that would that would be needed for Yarfella to, um, to 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 realize this. These are sort of uh, the two curves that we produce. So one is for a 10 percent decrease every year, and the other one is for a 15 percent decrease every year. And you can see the historical emissions there before; they're actually going down quite 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 a lot, except in 2012 when something happened. I'm not really sure what that was actually. Uh, but they're sort of quite quickly going down, both of those curves, of course, and as Jesse and Kevin mentioned, we really want to aim for the blue one um, if you want to do a poll on the full share. Um, so if you look at this in a little bit more detail, um, these are the emissions generated within the territory um, of Yarfela commune, and the, from different sectors, you could say. So 
Can anybody guess without looking at the bottom what the top line is? Yes, it says there, of course, so that's a stupid question. Uh, you, can't, you can't help to cheat. Uh, but it's, it says transport. So those, that is transport. So that is cars, that is buses, that, those are also trucks. Those are different machines, uh, different things that transport goods and people around Yartala. So actually the biggest part of your emissions right now are, are from transport. The other categories which are down at the bottom and, and also very important of course but not as large uh, is from um, energy, so energy production or energy uh, use and in general but also uh, machinery, so different uh, machinery involved in construction. We saw a lot of building going on when we came in here to Yarfella and, and I think a lot of it's from that. Um, and then there's a few other categories which are too small to be put into here. Uh, but you can actually see that the emissions um, um, reductions from energy is actually decreased uh, quite a bit from 20,000 kilotons down to 6,000 in the last 10 years. But transport is really the, the major emitter in, in terms of the emissions in the region. But then of course, as, as Jess and Kevin mentioned, there's also other emissions that are, that are generated from people living in Yarfella when they, if they fly somewhere or if there's things that are consumed. I know Parkabi is here, right? Yep. Yeah, so that's obviously, a, a, you know, that's a lot of consumption going on there, a lot of things that are bought and sold, and those emissions aren't a part of our analysis here. But, um, so if you look at this at the Swedish, so if we compare the Järfela emissions from different sectors and we compare that a little bit to the similar categories but on the national level, it's quite interesting to see the big difference. And it should also be said that actually the emissions uh, in, in Järfela is this quite small part of, of Sweden's all emissions. That doesn't mean that they're not important, but it means that you have a small, it's a very small percentage of the emissions. And that I think is mainly also because there's no heavy industry. And in, you can see, for example, industry in this, in this graph, it's this one. Uh, fourth from the bottom, that's almost the biggest one after, Nash, after transport within the country that, 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 that gives these emissions. So there's obviously other places, other municipalities that have heavy industry that also might, in some ways sometimes maybe Yarfala is, is benefited from this. Uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, that's the reason why well, the emissions in Yarfala partly are, are, are smaller than other regions. Probably other things as well as, you know, how much how much you, you know, average income affects the amount of carbon dioxide you, you emit usually, and we'll go into that in more detail uh, later on. Um, just as an illustrative example here to show two different trends in, in the Swedish context, again, then I'll go back to Järfela. The red line is, is uh, emissions from international transport, so that's flying and most, uh, it accounts for most of the shipping, so sending goods and also going by persons from, to and from Sweden. That has really been increasing, so that's something that, that's a trend that we need to break and try to bring down, obviously very quickly as well. A more positive trend has been uh, the, the way we heat houses in, in Sweden. There are also some details there which we haven't really gone into in terms of how, how much, if that, if that data is actually trustworthy, but it, it's, it's at least it's a trend that is, 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 is a positive one and it's something maybe we should look into when thinking about other sectors that need to bring down their emissions as well. So just as an example to sort of look at these two. And there's obviously behavior behind this that is driving these trends as well, so we need to understand that. How many of you have been uh, there? Some of you maybe work there even, yeah. And for those of you who haven't been there, that's, that's Järfela Commune's, uh, one of their offices, I guess the main office, right, yeah, uh, in Jakobsberg. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd sort of bring this picture in here because it came to me last night as I was presenting this part of the presentation. Uh, this, this, this idea of Grav that is Lord just suddenly came into my head. And I wondered, I wonder where that is from. Uh, and actually this is, this is in reference to um, a Swedish author uh, who in 1978 uh, wrote the book Grav that is Lord. It's a, a man called Sven Lindqvist. And the idea was that I won't go into detail what it was, but the idea, it was actually a bit of an interesting, it, it was an interesting insight for me. I had, didn't know about this, but it was a reaction a little bit to that knowledge was only created at universities rather than created in the field or in places where people lived and worked. And his, his argument was that we need to take back knowledge production, not only that people like me at universities should be creating the kind of knowledge that we need to address, for example, climate change. That should be created by, by people also in, in, in Yarfala people working in politics, but also the citizens of Yafela. Um, and 
I was looking at your little, um, the, the commune symbol as well. Um, there. But I think uh, the last point I want to make there is that you should dig where you, so this is dig where you stand, Kevin. Uh, if you, uh, so dig where you stand, so work from where you are and what you can work with, if that's your own emissions or within your school or within your municipality, your different roles. But we also have to, the, the second part of that is of course we have to um, maybe have a vision that stretches a little bit further than our own municipality and also into the future. So that we can't just get focused on what we do here in our schools and with our own lives, we also have to th think ahead. And I think maybe that's something that university and research can help out with, with doing as well. And that's what we tried to do with this report. Um, and that's captured a little bit in this, hopefully in this, in this graph, uh, which we created for this report, but it also connects to this, um, this initiative that I'm working with in, in Uppsala uh, that is a 10-year um, uh, research uh, initiative on climate change and leadership. So how can leadership be brought about at the individual level, at the municipal level, at the national level, international level, to start to deal with some of these really challenging issues that we have with climate change? And realizing that it's a really interplay with, between bottom-up solutions and top-down solutions. If we have just one or the other, it's never going never gonna, to never gonna work. Um, and this schematic here is, is, is trying to capture this idea that within Yarfala, which is the inner circle there, um, you have emissions that are part of the municipality's own operations. So I would guess the school, for example, is part of Yarfala Commune, so it's part of the emissions of Yarfala Commune. There are obviously other functions in Yarfala that the municipality has an ability to directly influence. So that's the sort of, it's not, it's not correctly distributed there, but we, we didn't have time to go into details about this. But there is a section of the missions, a part of the missions in Yarfala that the municipality can affect directly within its operations. There are other activities within the municipality, like people driving their cars around the municipality, or, or, or construction going up and so forth, that the municipality um, can influence, but they don't have a direct uh, mandate to, to change. But you can really put policies in place to change this, these types of emissions. So there's an important distinction to make there. I'm sure those of you in politics here are, are very much aware of this. <laughs> I became aware of it during the, the research as well, but this is an important distinction to make. Um, but then there's also an ability for Yarafala really to drive uh, change at the national level. And also, in, in I think, um, if you could spin this in a positive way, you could also see that Yarafala could take a leadership in this and then other municipalities could follow suit. So Yarfala was the first municipality that contacted us, but we've actually been contacted by quite a few municipalities now who also want carbon budgets. So that's really positive that, that I think you've set an example in, in some ways with Yarfala being first, but then we don't have time even to answer all the municipalities that want to have this now. So we have to figure out a way to make that more yeah, easily available and that they can calculate their own carbon budgets with, with our help. Um, but then there's really this global dimension as well, which have been, has been touched on before, that I mean, there are also ways that, of course, a municipality, but also a nation like Sweden has responsibility to support other countries in their transitions. Um, and I think there's this idea of Venn, Utter, for example, so different municipalities that, that or regions or cities that can, um, that can support each other in, in various topics. And that might be one model that could be developed in Yarfell as well with, with uh, regions or municipalities or cities in the global south, for example. So, some quick stats and then some final slides. Um, population is 74,000 today in Yarfala. Um, it's quite a large commuting population, you maybe you know this already, but a lot of people living in Yarfala uh, travel out of uh, the municipality to work and then come back. Um, there's a lot of ongoing and planned construction. I, I, I noticed this as we, as we came into Yarfala today, uh, also on the billboards, it was part of the slogans of getting more neighbors and these sort of things. So, um, the ambition, which I've heard from in the municipality, is to build a thousand new homes per year uh, and to aim for a population of 100,000 by 2030. And that last part there is the public transportation. The, the, I've heard that there's a metro station coming to, to Barkabi. So these are sort of some of the things going on that might be important to think about in relationship to thinking about these reductions in carbon emissions. Um, some of them are you know, create more challenges, other provide opportunities perhaps as well to, that we can think about. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. So I think one of the main challenges and, and opportunities also is to really decarbonize, to so take out carbon emissions from uh, new, new construction going up and also from the transport in the region. And that's 
maybe both of those are tricky in, in different respects, but that's something that you should aim for. And you can really work in three spheres here that I'll have three slides that follow here. So it's on the energy demand side. So the, basically the, the demand side is when you use the energy and then the supply side is when you provide the energy. So there's different things we can do on both those, those ends of the, of, the, of the chain. And there's also a few other policy measures. But it's really this interplay between the municipal, the regional, uh, so Landstyrelsen, the Landstyrelsen in Sweden, and also the national level that has to be thought through. And that's, we're doing that work as well. So we're in conversation with uh, Landstyrelsen, and we're also in conversation with the national government uh, in terms of how these sort of things can be put in place. Because a lot of things municipalities can't do on their own. They can do a lot, but they can't do everything. So uh, that's the challenge for us as well that we're trying to work with. So here are just some ideas, and these are very preliminary. They're just, uh, but it's, and they're geared more towards, in some respects, they're geared more towards policymakers than maybe high school students. But um, think about these, and there's a few examples that I think, you know, are really uh, important to be aware of, anyways, and ideas also. These are this is more of the sort of solution space that we're heading into here. So on the energy demand side. At least all new buildings should be at least passive house standards. That means they shouldn't be net producers of carbon emissions. They should, and even better if they could actually be producing energy. So being net positive, producing renewable electricity, having solar panels on the roof. There's not many solar panels that I saw at least in, in, on the roofs here in Yarashala. Um, it's also dealing with current buildings, so retrofitting, so uh, making current buildings more energy effective. Um, some of these policies might be more appropriate on the national level and others are more appropriate on the municipal level, but uh, you can really do a lot on um, creating standards for, uh, for, for example, new cars and electrifying the, the sort of transportation system in Sweden. Um, so, if, for example, if you, put, um, if you put a maximum amount of CO2 that could be emitted per kilometer driven from a car of 100 grams, and then you decrease that every year by 8%, quite quickly you would see really rapid reductions. And the industry would sort of, I think you use the word, they would squirm and squiggle for a while, but then after a while they would see that this is actually what's driving innovation and actually driving an, an increasing competition between companies that the ones that are able to solve this will be the ones that are delivering the, the transportation systems of tomorrow. Um, but I think a really important point that we haven't really touched about on that much before, that we really need policies to drive behavioral change by high energy users. High energy users. And some examples there are, you can have these progressive metering tariffs. So for example, let's say um, that you take one flight per year, you would pay, pay the normal price. If you took two flights per year, you would pay twice the price for the second flight. The third flight would cost four times. The fourth flight would cost eight, eight times. That way you would really decrease emissions, and specifically from those that flew a lot, rather than from those that just flew once in a while and so forth. There's other um, options there you can do. You can also talk about personal carbon allowance, so dividing the carbon budget even down to the individual level, which we haven't done in this report, of course. And with all these sort of types of measures combined, some research says that uh, you're able to bring down, in a country like Sweden or the UK, you can bring down energy demand and hence also emissions by 40 to 70 percent in 10 to 15 years. And then we're talking about sort of that's part of the solution of where we have to be heading in terms of dealing with two degrees centigrade. And just very briefly on this, this uh, behavioral side and the equity side in terms of how the, because the emissions across the world and also in uh, Sweden and also in a municipality like Jarfella, even in a room like this, where the emissions come from when it comes to individual people is, is quite different. So I would guess that if you take this room, 80% of the emissions would come from 20% of the people. So 80% of the emissions would come from 20% of the and this, uh, people. This, this, this plays out pretty evenly wherever you go, actually, if you look at it. So we really need to understand this uh, in more detail and, and see how we can develop policies to respond to that. Um, an example here is also that if 50% of all global carbon emissions comes from 10% of the population. So it's only 10% of the population that is creating half of the problem that we're talking about here. So if you could aim policies that are geared towards these 10%, and they're not only 10%, it's not only people in the West or in countries like, or in regions like Europe or in the United States, these are also people in other countries that are very wealthy, usually, that are part of this 10%. Probably quite a few of us in this room, probably most of us, are part of that 10%. So if we, if we gear policies toward these 10% uh, top emitters, 
Uh, just to give you a little bit of an example here, if we were to reduce their carbon footprint through policies or by voluntary uh, decreases in emissions of the 10 top percent of emitters in the world, and we would decrease them to the average, the level of the average European citizen, that's not, you know, that's not that bad. That, that's something that most people could live with, at least currently. That would mean that we would cut the global emissions by 33% overnight. So that, that is a huge part of how you could start bringing down the emissions in, in, in the direction that we need to be heading. On the supply side, so the demand side is important, but the supply side, which is mostly the side that uh, most politicians and a lot of, a lot of academics and uh, like to talk about, a lot of engineers. I'm a former, or I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, but I don't do much engineering anymore. Uh, I like technology. And this is the side that we, we usually uh, like to talk about because it doesn't have to deal with these tricky things called humans. Um, that, that relate to things in different ways. So, um, one thing we can do on the supply side is, of course, that we should really bring about a major electrification program in Sweden, and also that is also true in, in Jarfala. 30% um, of all energy used comes from electricity, more or less, in Sweden. So, 70% of energy doesn't come from electricity. And it's really tricky to bring down emissions uh, from if, unless you electrify uh, at a massive scale as well when it comes to other, other sources. So that goes for transport, uh, that goes for the industry, to electrify the industry. Uh, we could also work much more with higher rated interconnectors, so work more with intermittency issues between countries, so when there's different amounts of renewable energy production, when the sun isn't shining here, but it's sun sh shining in Norway, when the wind is blowing in Sweden, when not in Norway, then we could actually be, uh, be uh, transmitting energy back and forth much, much, uh, much more efficiently and much smarter than uh, we are doing today. Uh, so it's really rethinking the whole energy system, I would say, uh, and really um, working with things like smart grids uh, that directly um, are, are in interacting with the amount of uh, energy that is supplied by, for example, renewables, and then, um, uh, and then distributing that in a more efficient manner. Also the idea of community energy, I think, is really important. It sends a really strong message if communities start to produce their own energy, but also, uh, so that could be solar panels, it could also be windmills, it could be other forms of of uh, renewable energy. Um, and I won't go into details which ones those are. I think in Sweden, really, solar and wind are two of the main ones that, 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 are, that are really, uh, could be rolled out even more. There's also w uh, tidal power, wave power, there's hydropower, of course, in Sweden, which is very low emit emitting. It doesn't emit very much, all the big dams. It has other issues with it, but it's from a carbon perspective or a climate perspective, it's, it's very low carbon. Also, things like nuclear power is, is, is quite low carbon. The problem is, of course, that it has other issues uh, with, with nuclear. But uh, from a carbon perspective, it might be quite uh, you know, appropriate. But the problem there is that you can't build them fast enough in terms of replacing uh, the use from other energy sources. We could also work much more with indigenous biomass, so biomass that's grown in Sweden, uh, biogas, and, and also um, if we produce electricity that can't be used right away, we can convert it to various forms that, that can sort of be used at a later point. So this idea of power to gas, so for example, biogas can, can be also part of that um, uh, suite of options. I think some other policy measures that are really important, uh, that, that it's, and again, it's not maybe all of them are possible to um, apply to mun the municipal level, but some of them are. And one of them is the rapid retirement of all hydrocarbon assets. So this is, I don't know how many of you have heard of the, the idea of um, um, divestment. No? You should, you, should, uh, you should check it out. I think it's a really, really powerful uh, uh, tool to, to, instead of investing in fossil fuels, for example, com uh, so companies, schools, uh, universities, uh, different institutions can choose to divest, so take away their investments in fossil fuel companies and industries and invest them in alternatives. So uh, this idea of moving capital, moving financial flows to invest in the future rather than investing in old energy technologies, that's this, um, this idea. But then also, of course, um, it's, when it comes to Sweden, of course, it was a shame that we decided to, to sell the coal mine to the Czechs, the one in Germany. Um, instead of, of, of retiring it. That's, that was a real disgrace, I think, for, for being a Swede, that we, we couldn't have the, the sort of capacity to, to envision what, what this might entail globally as well, to take leadership and actually choose to close the mine instead of selling it. Um, there are also things on the technical side that um, might be needed when it comes to cement and steel production. You 
can really take away all the emissions uh, by just um, you know produce. It, it can't be produced in a completely um, uh, non-emitting way. So this idea of carbon capture and storage, which I won't go into, could be uh, really important when it comes to cement production and steel production. Um, I think Kevin wrote this slide because <laughs> he says there's a moratorium on our airport expansion. I, I, I would agree as well. This this idea that we're that was already been mentioned that we're building more airports, especially up in in the mountains where we're, you know, because we're building the airport, we're going to increase the emissions, which means there's going to be less snow, which means that we're building the airport to go skiing there is quite a strange, strange thing. Uh, but anyways, it's the one in Salem. Um, we also need a major investment in development of public transportation, such as high-speed rail, um, subways and trams. I mentioned the subway going into Barkabi. Perhaps that could also help, you know, to decrease the sort of the, the emissions coming from, from uh, uh, the transport system in, in Yerifala. We also need to think about how investment is done, so create longer investment cycles, so really think about the, the, the length of time that we think about uh, our investments has to change slightly, and also this has to do something with the discount rate, so the, the amount of um, a di disappreciation of value that we put on, on a good that we buy, or a service, or a, a, a product, is the discount rate, so if that's really high, that means very quickly things are not going to be as valuable in the future as they are right now. But if it's a lower discount rate, that means that we can actually value the future more than we do today. So this goes from everything, all the things that we invest in, and that, that could be really be helpful as well. So to round off, I think what we try to present and what we've come to realize in this report is that these are really unprecedented challenges. There's very few historical examples of any sort of transition like this actually playing out on a, not only on a regional or on a national, but also on a global scale. When, we, when we've seen societies change really quickly in the past has been more when it comes to crises, or wars, these sort of situations. Um, but I think it's important to think about that when we're talking about is actually, it's about our survival. So as, as a species, but also as you know, citizens of Sweden and Jarfella, it's about the survival of people across the world. Um, and so not relating to this and just going on as, as if nothing sort of is really happening is really unthinkable, at least from my perspective, because that means that we will have uh, a future where, where there is not so much of a future. Uh, so I think what we really need is bold visions and leadership, and it's, it's really, you know, it's fantastic to, to have gotten this opportunity from Jarfala that you actually asked us to do this report, because I think hopefully we, and we're going actually later this week to, to Norway as well, to Oslo, who's also done a carbon budget, and then to Bergen, and there's other cities around that are actually in the region starting to think about this quite, quite in detail, so that's, that's hopeful, and I think we, could, we need to build on that. And we did mention a few case studies and examples that, that we, you could sort of have a look at in more detail as well. We didn't, we didn't analyze them, but Oslo, I mentioned already, they have a carbon budget, and we have a seminar on Tuesday next week, which I think will be screened. Um, there's this network called C40, which is 40 mega cities around the world. So the mayors of these cities have come together and said that they will try to address climate change in a, in a way. I, I, we haven't looked at the actual, I don't think they, have, they haven't come as far as developing carbon budgets, but there it's still, it's, it's, it's an ambitious plan. Um, I haven't put that in the list, or there's also um, uh, business coalitions like Haga Initiative in Sweden that have more ambitious uh, goals than the Swedish government, for example. So I think businesses and industry could also, you know, if they could take a lead as well as municipalities and regions, that might be really interesting how that could play out. Um, and on that note, there's in Uppsala there's this thing called the Climate Protocol, which is a coalition of, uh, of the municipality, the universities, uh, businesses, and a few civil society organizations and trying to create um, uh, collaborations across these sectors. Um, they don't have a carbon budget either, so we're gonna be pushing them to, to get one. Um, and then there's also civil society and there's sort of bottom-up initiatives as well across the world. One of them that came from the UK is this idea of transition towns where you really try to mobilize citizens in regions to, to be a part of the solution rather than waiting for politicians to make the decision, actually be a part of, of, of changing the way we, we work and the way we live and the way we move about. That's another example that I think is good to, to look up if you haven't heard of it. Um, another thing we came across was, of course, Sveriges uh, Eko-Kommuner and Klimatkommunerna. Um, is Jarfala part of both of those? Or? You're planning to be part of it, yeah. So it looked really interesting when we started looking into those as well, that, that this idea of collaboration across municipalities, I think, is also really important in this work. 
And then, of course, Yarfella is, is a case study and a positive example that we hope to, uh, we look forward to following uh, in the years ahead, and how, how this report will, uh, will hopefully at least have, have an impact on some of the choices that are made and also the way that citizens and politicians in Yarfella are working up ahead. Um, so to round off, I think it's also important that Sweden really is, is, is you know, challenged in this approach as well. We're really working on this as well. We're trying to work with the government, but also with the Riksdag and bringing these issues to them. That, that you know, in order for municipalities to lead by example also, it's, it's, it's really important that Sweden at the national level also gain some understanding of, of some of the things that we've been researching uh, for Jarfella. Uh, so the idea that the climate change law should be based on carbon budgets is something we're pushing. Um, we think it should be explicitly informed by science and equity. Um, we talked about the negative emission technologies, the nets, that that is a sort of a, an excuse to not reduce emissions now and hope that a technology in the future will, created by one of you or somebody else, will solve the issue. That's something that we, should, we shouldn't rely on. If they are developed and they actually, against the odds, tend to work, that might mean that we could start even you know, pushing for 1.5 degrees if if we do everything that we talked about so far in this talk. Um, but we really, really need to uh, also think about the, the larger context and the global south that have been the, 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 the country, the poorer countries of the world, the poorer people of the world have not been a part of creating the problem of climate change, but they're the ones who will suffer the worst consequences of climate change. So it's a real moral dilemma uh, for, for us as, as the global community to sort of think about how we deal with that. And it doesn't seem to me that we're dealing very well with it right now, looking at the, the refugee crisis, the refugee crisis, and, and if, if, I mean, if, if climate change really plays out, this, what we've seen in the last five years is nothing to what we'll see up ahead. So I think this is something really, really to think through and think about how will we react when, uh, when there is more uh, people moving across the globe. But I think, we can do, I think we can really build on something in Sweden, at least this is something that I hope we could build on. Uh, this idea of a social contract, Kevin is better to s speak about this because he's coming from the UK directly and seeing that, you know, the differences between the United Kingdom and England and Sweden, that there are still quite big differences in terms of this idea that there's trust in, in, in society still and that this is something that really, that we should build upon in our municipalities, in our country. And, and hopefully, you know, take back this idea that, that, that there, there should be trust between the government, the country, and the people uh, living in the country. Uh, and we have this international reputation still. I don't know how long we'll, we'll, we'll hold on to it, but I hope we can sort of make, make ourselves uh, worthy of that reputation. And a fi final message of hope to finish is from a man called Robert Unger from South America. And he's, he says that, at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. So I think this is, a, this is really the task, not only to, you know, this is the task of everybody, it's an intergenerational <coughs> challenge to really provide clarity from science and these sort of analyses, but also the imagination to think that we could do things differently. And I think, at least, I, my impression is that you feel at least with asking us to do this, you, you've started that process to really think with more clarity and imagination around this challenge. So thank you for um, letting us do that and for coming here and thank you for Tak för att ni lyssnade. Här är lite grann av vad vi gör i Järfälla. Rapporten visade ju att vi skulle minska våra koldioxidutsläpp med 10-15 procent per år. Eh, och det var främst inom transporter och byggnation som vi kunde jobba med de här frågorna i Järfälla. Vi är med i Fossilfritt Sverige eh, och vi kommer att ta fram en energi- och klimatplan, precis som Isak nämnde. Vi bedriver eh, regionalt en energi- och klimatrådgivning som är väldigt, vad ska man säga, proaktiv. Vi har genomfört flera föreläsningar inom Länet som handlar om just laddstolpar som du var inne på och även solenergi. Så vi jobbar väldigt mycket med de frågorna som är utåtriktade inom energi- och klimatrådgivning i länet. Sen så har vi äskat medel från budget för att vi vill försöka gå med i de här förbunden. Klimatkommunerna, Sveriges ekokommuner och Biogas Öst. Den sistnämnda har vi fattat beslut om att vi ska gå med i. Och sen så genomför vi också uppföljning systematiskt om vad vi faktiskt gör i vår 
miljöbarometer, miljöläget heter det. Eh, sen har vi också genomfört ett projekt som heter Klimatsmarta järfällabor som ni kan fråga mig mer om efter vi fikat. Och så inom transporter då, vad jobbar vi med? Det är lite så här, kommunen har inte rådighet över allt, eh, men vårt mål handlar om vår geografiska yta. Eh, vad vi har rådighet om, då är det faktiskt eh, våra tjänsteresor. Och genom att genomföra en zeroanalys som vi har genomfört tre gånger, så kan vi faktiskt minska eh, våra transporter. Eh, koldioxidutsläpp från transporter, eh, från våra tjänsteresor men också pendlingsresor till jobbet och räknas in i den här. Och den här seroanalysen som genomförs är väldigt åtgärdsinriktad. Så det är flera kommuner som genomfört in i Sverige eh, och man skulle också kunna bygga ut den så att det är lite större företag i järnfärda kommun som kan ingå i den här seroanalysen. Eh, och där har vi just nu i år genomfört en tredje och internt då så kan vi jobba med 15 procent i minskning med de här åtgärderna. Bland annat handlar det om att minska resandet. Men vi vet ju att vi behöver resa kollektivt om vi ska resa. Och det satsar vi på jättemycket i alla fall. Vi har det här utbyggda kollektivtrafiken i form av tunnelbana till Barkabystaden och kommunen bekostar specifikt en del av utbyggnationen. Vi betalar extra för att få en till uppgång. Och vi kommer också få SJ-trafik till Barkabystaden. Så det är liksom eh, rätt mycket som kommer att, att minskas där, hoppas vi på, i kompensation till att vi faktiskt bygger. Eh, det kommer ju faktiskt öka de här utsläppen från arbetsmaskiner som Isak visar en bild på när vi bygger tusen bostäder om året. Så nu är vi med i ett regionalt nätverk som heter Resmart och vi genomför vad heter det, trafikantveckan årligen och vi bygger ut gång- och cykelnät. Är det någon som kommer ihåg den här? Ja, ah, det var inte så länge sedan. Det här är kyrt. Parken, söder om kyrkparken, efter ett skyfall, jag tror att det här var 2015. Så, så här kommer det att kunna se ut om vi inte tänker på de här frågorna ordentligt. Vi måste göra det när vi planerar. Och det gör vi, kan man säga. Och hur gör vi då då? Jo, bland annat så ställer vi krav i markanvisning. 30 procent under gällande PPR-normen. Och det är från den från 2008 som jag pratar om då. Och det innebär att vi måste, eh, de som bygger, de måste ha en förbrukning på 77 kWh eh, per kvadratmeter och år. Och det är eh, svåra krav att eh, klara av. Men vi har ställt dem och vi kan göra det för att vi äger marken. Så vi som kommun har tur i järnfällan att vi äger marken och kan ställa sådana krav. Vad sa du? Boverkets regler. Ja. Eh, och sen har vi Barkabystaden som har ett miljöprogram, miljökvalitetsprogram, där det här står med. Så det är liksom beslutat att vi ska jobba med det här. Och vi kan ställa de här kraven från början, men vi kan också följa upp det. Eh, det är jätteviktigt att vi gör det. Och det är inte alla som kanske jag har gjort det. Så därför har vi varit med i det här pilotprojektet CityLab som är SGBCs pilotprojekt. Och det handlar om hållbar stadsutveckling så det ska bli en hel hållbar stadsdel som vi också då kan följa upp. Och sen handlar det om dagvattenhantering då. För det är just det här med översvämningsrisken i området som vi exploaterar. Det måste vi tänka på jättemycket och vi har också en bästa å som är känslig. Så det finns massor med saker som vi måste beakta när vi planerar. Och det är olika pusselbitar. Eh, något som vi jobbar med, eh, också, som du också nämnde, att det inte såg så många solceller. 
Jag hoppas att vi kommer att kunna förändra det, för vi är den första kommunen i landet som har tecknat ett leasingavtal. Och då kommer vi att kunna sätta upp solceller på byggnader i större omfattning och i snabbare takt än vad vi hade kunnat göra annars. För att det blir alltså billigare att vi hyr och på det viset så blir det faktiskt billigare än att bara köpa el. Så det som har tidigare varit ett hinder att investera i solcellerna, det gör vi nu genom att hyra från ett företag. Och det här är upphandlat och klart och det, det är ett sätt som man kan faktiskt kan få rull på det här tror vi. För det har varit lite långsamt, det kan jag hålla med. Sen så var det också någon som frågade om köttkonsumtion och sådana saker. Vi kan ju faktiskt eh, göra en del. Eh, det är inte mer i den här rapporten, just vad vi äter. Men det, där kan vi faktiskt påverka i upphandlingsprocessen som vi måste följa i kommunerna. Vi kan välja klimatsmart mat på skolor. Vi kan erbjuda det på äldreboende. Och eh, vi kan också ställa krav på transporter vid upphandlingar. Och det försöker vi göra nu. För det, det är någonting som, som vi tror att eh, det här är också någonting som vi kan följa upp. För det här är också en sak med, med upphandling. Man måste kunna följa upp de krav vi ställer. Eh, men här, här har vi alltså en jättestor påverkan. Eh, jag tror att Sverige handlar för ungefär 625 miljarder kronor per år offentligt. Och det som man kan säga om att vi har pratat en del om framtiden. Och det är ju så att vi vet ju inte riktigt vad som kommer att hända med klimatförändringarna. Och det är därför vi tillämpar försiktighetsprincipen. Och vi kommer att försöka jobba med klimatfrågan i Järfra kommun. Och vi kommer att försöka minska på så många områden som vi bara kan. För att nå det här 10-15 procent minskning per år. Tack för att du lyssnade.